Welcome to ATRMCHRU Virtual Research Classroom Following are a few reminders before we begin. It is helpful to use a two-way earphones and headset for clearer audio input. Lectures are in PowerPoint presentation. Device must be in full screen mode for better viewing. Questions, you may send them to our email address. Answers to your questions will be posted in the virtual classroom as a separate queue and a video as soon as available. After this lecture, an assessment form will be sent to you. Kindly accomplish this form to receive your certificate of attendance. This may be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Good day. The topic of today's lecture is Ethics in Research Writing. Our speaker is the Hospital Research Unit's Assistant Chair for Research Development. He graduated from the UP College of Medicine in 2013. He did his residency at Rehabilitation Medicine at UP PGH where he was the chief resident from 2018 to 2019 at the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. From November 2018 to January 2019, he studied abroad at the University of Trento, Italy, as part of the European Union Rice Dream Aging and Technology Exchange Program. He became an island doctor at the Metropolitan Doctors Medical Clinic in Boracay. He was also a sports and conditioning coach at Moro Lorenzo Sports Complex and Ateneo di Manila University. At present, he is a visiting consultant in physical and rehabilitation medicine at Lorma Medical Center, City of San Fernando, La Union, at Metro Vegan Hospital and at Northside Doctors Hospital, Bantay Ilocosur. Currently, he is a consultant at the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Medicine, Ilocos Training and Regional Medical Center. Let us now welcome and listen to Dr. John Michael T. Mendoza. Good day. Once again, I am Dr. John Michael Mendoza a rehabilitation medicine consultant and part of ITRMC Hospital Research Unit. This will be the second part of my lecture regarding ethics in research writing. For the outline of the part two of my lecture, we will continue with research misconduct, human participants in research, sharing of research results, authorship and the allocation of credit, and competing interests. We will start with research misconduct. Research misconduct is defined as fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing, performing, or reviewing research, or in reporting research results. The three elements of misconduct are defined as follows. Fabrication is making up data or results. Falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data or results such as the research is not accurately represent, represented in the research record. Plagiarism is the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. In addition, it is said that to be considered research misconduct, actions must represent a significant departure from accepted practices must have been committed intentionally or knowingly or recklessly and must be proven by a preponderance of evidence. Examples of misconduct include abuse of confidentiality in peer review, failure to allocate credit appropriately in scientific publications, not observing regulations governing research, failure to report misconduct, or retaliation against individuals who report misconduct to the list of behaviors that are considered misconduct. A crucial distinction between falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism are sometimes called FFP 
and error or negligence is the intent to deceive. When researchers intentionally deceive their colleagues by falsifying information, fabricating research results, or using other words and ideas without giving credit, they are violating fundamental research standards and basic societal values. These actions are seen as the worst violations of scientific standards because they undermine the trust on which science is based. The next part of our lecture is the human participants in research. Any scientist who conducts research with human participants needs to protect the interests of research subjects by complying with federal, state, and local regulations and with relevant codes established by professional groups. These provisions are designed to ensure that risks to human participants are minimized, that risks are reasonable given the expected benefits, that the participants or their authorized representatives provide informed consent, that the investigator has informed the participants of key elements of the study protocol, and that the privacy of participants and the confidentiality of data are maintained. Research involving human participants also must be reviewed and approved by independent committees, known as institutional review boards. And in the case of ITRMC, we have the Research Ethics Committee, or the REC. The IRB or REC specifies which type of research falls under the, its jurisdiction, the provisions for obtaining informed consent, the procedures needed to gain approval of a project, and the training that researchers must undergo to use human participants in research. IRBs must approve all research with human subjects, must conduct regular reviews of such research, and must review and approve proposed changes in ongoing research. IRBs also have the authority to monitor informed consent procedures, gather information on adverse events, and examine conflicts of interest. The involvement of human participants in research can raise difficult questions. Should people be asked to participate in studies that involve some risk to themselves with no prospect of benefit, benefits? How should consent provisions be modified for children, prisoners, the mentally ill, the undereducated, or other vulnerable populations? Should the same provisions apply to all research conducted everywhere in the world? or should standards be modified to reflect local conditions. Next, we will proceed to authorship and allocation of credit. When the paper is published, the list of authors indicates who has contributed to the work. Apportioning credit for work done as a team can be difficult, but the peer recognition generated by authorship is important in a scientific career and needs to be allocated appropriately. Authorship conventions may differ greatly among disciplines and among research group. Many journals and professional societies have published guidelines that lay out the conventions for authorship in particular disciplines. Several considerations must be weighed in determining the proper division of credit between investigators working on a project. If one researcher has defined and put a project into motion and a second researcher is invited to join in later, the first researcher may receive much of the credit for the project even if the second researcher makes major contributions. Similarly, when an established researcher initiates a project, that individual may receive more credit than a beginning research who spent much of his time or her time working on the project. When a beginning researcher makes an intellectual contribution to a project, that contribution deserves to be recognized, including when the work is undertaken independently of a laboratory's principal investigator. Established researchers are well aware of the importance of credit in science, where traditions expect them to be generous in their allocation of credit to beginning researchers. Sometimes, a name is included in a list of authors even though the person had little or nothing to do with the content of a paper. Including honorary, 
guests or gift authors dilutes the credit due to people who actually did the work, inflates the credentials of the added authors, and makes the proper attribution of credit more difficult. Journals, the administrators of research institutions, and researchers should all work to avoid this practice. Similarly, ghost authorship, where a person who writes a paper is not listed among the authors, misleads readers and also should be condemned. Policies at most scientific journals state that the person should be listed as the author of a paper only if that person made a direct and substantial intellectual contribution to the design of the research, the interpretation of the data, or the drafting of the paper. Just providing the laboratory space for a project or furnishing a sample used in the research is not sufficient to be included as an author, though such contributions may be recognized in a footnote or in a separate acknowledgement section. The, the acknowledgement sections also can be used to thank others who contributed to the work reported by the paper. The list of authors establishes accountability as well as credit. When the paper is found to contain errors, whether caused by a mistake or deceit, authors might wish to disavow responsibility, saying that they were not involved in the part of the paper containing the errors or that they had very little to do with the paper in general. However, an author who is willing to take credit for a paper must also bear responsibility for its errors or explain why he or she had no professional responsibility for the material in question. For the last part of my lecture will be competing interests or your conflict of interest. Researchers have many interests including personal, intellectual, financial, and professional interests. These interests often exist in tension. Sometimes they clash. The term conflict of interest refers to situations where researchers have interests that could interfere with their professional judgment. Managing these situations is critical to maintaining the integrity of researchers and science as a whole. Conflicts of interest involving financial gain receive particular scrutiny in science. Researchers generally are entitled to benefit financially from their work, for example, by receiving royalties on inventions or bonuses from their employers. But in some cases, the prospect of financial gain could affect the design of an investigation, the interpretation of data, or the presentation of results. Indeed, even the appearance of a financial conflict of interest can seriously harm a researcher's reputation as well as a public's perception of science. Personal relationships may also create conflict of interest. Some funding agencies require researchers to identify others who have been their supervisors, graduate students, or postdoctoral fellows since these relationships are seen as having the potential to interfere with judgment about grants worthy of funding or papers worthy of publication. So this is the end of my lecture. Thank you for listening and hope you learned something you can use in writing your own research paper. Have a good day. Don't forget to like. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to be in the loop for new lectures.